Somebody came to me, one of the members, I'm not going to tell you who, and said, I hate you. For years and years and years and years and years, they had tried again and again and again, never had any results. So they lost hope, they lost faith. They were very skeptical that anything could happen there. I cannot change my wife. I tried in the beginning and it didn't go good. You start preaching at this time and you finish at 12 o'clock. If you don't finish, we leave. You can preach alone, we leave. <laughs> One of them said, the Holy Spirit leaves at 12 o'clock and we leave too. Let's bow our heads and have another word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your infinite, amazing love. And right now, as we talk practical things that we can do in the church, we pray that you, with your spirit, would open the hearts and the minds and inspire and transform so it will bear results that will be for your kingdom. Amen. We pray in Jesus' name and thank you, Lord. Amen. We are going to talk a little about practical things, and when I say practical things, um, probably what you'll notice is that I'm going to give principles and methods. Principles are always the same, every society, every time. Every church, doesn't matter, poor, rich, city, countryside, big, small, doesn't matter. For instance, prayer is a principle, people need to pray. But methods, what you need to understand, please pay attention now. Methods don't apply everywhere the same. You don't use the same methods in a rich church or in a poor church, in a countryside church or in a city church. You don't use the same methods. So methods have to adjust from situation to situation. Keep that in mind. Okay, let's read a few quotations quick. We read that one in the morning, didn't we? For people that have good memory, okay? <laughs> I almost said something. You know, somebody says, I got great pills for memory. They work. I just don't remember the name of the pills. The great work of the gospel is not going to close with less manifestation of power than it marks its opening. In fact, Amen. there is another quotation that says it's going to close with greater power than it started. Jesus says, you will do greater things than me. I want to ask you, where are those things? Where is that power? We go to church, we go home, and we feel something is missing. There is no power. Am I right? Yes. We'll talk about that tonight and tomorrow morning. I will have no time to finish tonight. This presentation takes about six hours. I will attempt to do it in one hour and a half. It's impossible. But anyway. The spirit of God can never come until the church should prepare the way. Should be earnest searching of heart. United, persevering, Watch the word, united, persevering prayer, and through faith claiming the promises of God. Okay, so, uh, this, giving God the credit entirely, I learned in my life that every time something goes good and I get a big head, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, pastor, that sermon was excellent. And in my mind, oh, that was a good sermon. <laughs> Every time I get a big head, I get a big hit. <laughs> and I read a quotation not too long ago where Ellen White says that the greatest sin was that Satan wanted to take God's place to be God. And he, what he did, he wanted God's glory for himself. And then she says, every time God works for us and we assume God's glory for us, we do what Satan did. When you get success, it's God's blessing entirely. It's not that, well, God did a lot and I did a little. No, God did it all. You made a mess. You did nothing. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I never allow myself, even if people come and say, oh, pastor, that was a good example. I say, praise the Lord. I cannot change my wife. I tried in the beginning and it didn't go good. 
I gave up changing people. God changes people. We just love people. Amen. You follow me? Amen. And so, giving God the credit, this case study was presented at the annual council, at the general conference, to the worldwide church as an example of how to grow a church. This case study was applied at least, I applied it at least in three different churches with totally different situations. In a very small, 40 people, very poor, countryside, broken church, very small, and it did miracles. And I applied it in a very rich, powerful, political and strong church with strong leaders that you cannot do what you want. They will move you in a second. It worked, it brought miracles. The principles work everywhere. Methods were totally different. We prayed there and there. But here we use the community center, here we use something different. Methods have to apply to the needs of that church and to the needs of that community. You hear me? A poor community has different needs than a rich community. Therefore, you cannot make plans and expect blessings and results. You need to ask God for plans because God knows the needs of those people. And only if you get the plan from God, you get the resources and the blessings from God. Hear me? Okay. And so, uh, I'm going to give you the story quick with our names, with our locations. I was in a church that, and I'm not going to, I have at least three examples, one in Romania, two in the U.S. I'm not going to go to all three because I need five, six, seven hours. <coughs> but one of them, for instance, uh, one of them moved 17 pastors in 21 years. That should say something to begin with. Okay? That should say something to begin with. Another one, two pastors got sick physically in hospital. When I got there, somebody came and unscrewed the, the how do you call them in English, the screws to my car wheels, the, the nuts, the lug nuts from my wheels, hoping that I have an accident and I die. Uh-huh, you heard it. <laughs> Uh, so, I'm not going to deal on the problems. I'm just going to give you the general picture. <coughs> the church, the one that I am referring to, didn't do that. The one that I am referring to was a good church with good people. Good in the heart, committed, hardworking. Nevertheless, no faith that things could change. Very skeptical that things could change. Because they have tried for years and years and years and years and years, they have tried again and again and again, never had any results. So they lost hope, they lost faith. They were very skeptical that anything could happen there. You follow me? Good people. They loved me to death. I could be a king to be there. They just loved me. So we talk about good people, okay? Now listen carefully. In that context, the church had, like most churches do, conflicts. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Or you never heard of that? <laughs> Conflicts, fights, problems. Moreover, three groups, one extremely liberal, and I'm not going to give you examples, like it's okay to go shopping after the church, we go to the mall. One extremely liberal, one extremely conservative. Don't smile, it's a sin, it's Sabbath. <laughs> if you don't have a tie, you cannot preach. And one extremely conservative, and one didn't believe in the Holy Spirit. And the three groups were fighting each other. They didn't eat meat, but they ate people. <laughs> you follow me? Yes, fighting each other. Biting each other. That's not a good environment. Fights, doesn't matter who wins. Nobody wins. When there is fight, the church goes down. Jesus prayed that we are one. Satan brings division. Okay? And so there were fights, there was division, there were conflicts. More than that, 
in about 90 to 100 members church, only 11 to 12 people did all the jobs. Basically, you have a motor and 90 wagons. And the motor has to pull all the weight for everybody. And then you wonder why some people get burnt out. Because they are lazy, I'm sorry. Good people, just too comfortable. Well, the, the church was made not very well prepared today. The program was not good. Stop criticizing. Get busy and make it good. Do something about it. You follow me? God gave you gifts. Don't bury them. Don't use them for yourself. Hello? All over the Bible, it talks about the gifts that God gave us. If you follow all parables that Jesus gave, people who don't act, who don't use their gifts, none of them are saved. The faithful servant, you remember the parable? That was supposed to feed the other servants and he got tired feeding them and he started to beat them. The lesson is those who don't work, they abuse, you know, by the way. And so when the master came, he, he was punished. The tree is supposed to, the fig tree is supposed to bear fruits, otherwise he gets chopped off. The, the talents, you are supposed to use them if, you, if they get blessed and multiplied. If you bury them, you pay for it. And so on, we can go to all the parables. Those who don't work, don't go to heaven. Works don't save you, but works prove that you love Jesus. Amen. You follow me? Yeah. And so, uh, there were 90% spectators and 10%, 11, 12% working. That's not a healthy church. According to the conference books, in the last 72 years, there was no growth. That doesn't mean no baptisms. They had an average of two to four baptisms a year. But they also had an average of two to four people leaving the church, an average of two to four people dying, an average of two moving in and two moving out. Basically, there was no growth. In fact, there was decline from here from 200, they got to 90 in 70 years. More than that, when I got there, my very, very first board meeting, I said, what do you do to reach the community? And they looked at me, you are not here to reach the community. You are here to give good sermons. <laughs> you start preaching at this time, and you finish at 12 o'clock. If you don't finish, we leave. You can preach alone. We leave. <laughs> One of them said, the Holy Spirit leaves at 12 o'clock, and we leave too. And I said, why don't you try to reach the community? And they said, because we did try. We did try. It doesn't work. Nobody's going to come. We spent, we had uh, big names, you know. Kenneth Cox spent 46,000. Nobody came. We had Ron Harverson spent 48,000. Nobody came. We had, and they gave me all the big guns of the Adventist church. We spent so much. Nobody came. We got tired spending and doing it, and nobody comes. A church of good people working hard, if you got sick in hospital, in one hour, people are there visiting you. People would go to your home and bring food. Good people. But have no faith in evangelism or Bible studies or church growth. It doesn't work. In this city, it doesn't work. You know, Bible Belt in the city, over 50 Baptist churches, the smallest one, 500 members, the biggest one, 12,000. You get the picture. They told me in our city, half are rich and half are Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> rich don't need the church. Baptists believe they have been saved. They said, when we try to do evangelism, the Baptist pastors told them, don't go to that church, they are evil. And nobody came. And they said, it doesn't make sense to try, pastor. If you want to do evangelism, move. We find the pastor who will take care of us. What do you do? When you get to that church. More than that, somebody came to me, one of the members, I'm not going to tell you who, and said, I hate you. I, I just came here yesterday, literally the second day. You Romanians are all thieves. <laughs> what? In my mind, how could you say, you don't even know me. She says, 20 years ago, I had a Romanian team to fix my roof. I paid them, they took the money, they left, they never came back. <laughs> what does it have to do with me? <laughs> there are many American thieves, and many uh, Polish thieves, and many uh, German thieves. 
There are good people and bad people in every society. You got burned with three Romanian guys. That doesn't mean that all, there are many hardworking, honest Romanians, you know? You Romanians, you are all thieves. I hate you. And she called the conference right away. Please move this guy. He's Romanian. <laughs> what do you do? I went to the board meeting, and one of them said in the board, with power and influence, don't you try to convince us to do evangelism, because we will move you. We move five pastors before you to try to do evangelism. We will move you. And in my mind, I don't even want to stay here if we don't work. <laughs> you cannot keep me still. If you want to punish me, keep me 10 minutes still, and you punish me. I'm going to go to a place where people work. I don't want to stay here. So what do you do? You have three options. Number one, fight them. That's not an option. <laughs> Number two, try to manipulate them. That doesn't work moreover with highly educated people, 16 physicians in the church, several business people, several managers, and several leaders, and several teachers, and several. I mean, when you talk about 16 doctors in the church, people that have power and money and influence, and they work with hundreds or thousands in hospital, and you know, those people are used to be the boss. And they expect you to listen when they talk. You know? So what do you do? To manipulate them? Not an option. They are not foolish. Third option, to do nothing. Become lazy. I give a sermon, go home, take a nap. Not an option. So what do you do? Pray. I want you to understand from now on what I say. Spiritual growth leads to all other growth. Did you hear me? Yes. You don't need to preach money. When you preach Christ, people who get Christ, they pay. You don't need to preach evangelism. When you preach Christ, people who get Christ, they will reach others. People, when they don't talk to others, is because they don't have what to tell. When you got Christ, and you experience grace, and you are saved, you will talk about it. Hello? You don't need to tell people what to do. You need to make sure that they find Christ. And I tell you, they are going to beg you to let them work. The way to heal a church is to connect them with God. Don't preach solutions to the problems. Preach God. That's what Paul says. I want to know nothing else except Christ and Him crucified. And so, I'm going to start... The, 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 the presentation. Now, spiritual growth always leads to health and growth in all other areas, including numerical growth. This is what you need to keep in mind as a principle. And I'm going to uh, really, I already gave you the, the, the background, division conflicts, low involvement, low attendance, pessimistic, skeptical about evangelism, grow Bible study. We talked about that, didn't we? Community, very educated, very affluent, very strong Protestant grip. We talked about that, didn't we? Yeah. Okay, process. Process. I want you to understand now. When we say prayer, prayer was not part of the process. Prayer was the process. Prayer was not part of the work. Prayer was the work. Prayer was not number one and then preaching number two. Prayer was number one and two and three and five and ten and every number. Basically, we immersed in prayer everything we did. Did you hear what I said? Because this is essential. How did we do it? Three steps. Number one, my wife and I prayed for them. Number two, my wife and I prayed with them. And number three, we asked them to pray for one another and for the community. Let me explain again. My wife and I prayed for them. How? Change, George Barna doing survey over 500 churches proved that all churches that changed, none of them changed faster than four years and a half. He analyzed 500 churches that changed. None of them changed in one or two years. The fastest it was four years and a half, the slowest six. Average five years to change. You don't change a church in one year. If you really want just to go and, go, uh, and leave, Different story. But if you want to see results, you need to commit to it for a long time. And you need to keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Persistence. If you really want to see results. 
because it takes a while for them to change 70 years of habits. People may say, uh-huh, uh-huh, they still do what they have done. It takes a while to get it, to click, and you know that, uh-huh, and then not only to believe it, but to support it and get involved in it. And then as soon as you leave, they go back to their old habits. It takes a while for them to be rooted in it. Basically, it takes time. You don't preach one sermon on prayer. You preach two years on prayer. I've been preaching six months on prayer in that church, the same sermon every Sabbath, literally. All I changed, I changed the Bible verse and the story, same sermon. And after six months of preaching on prayer, they came to me, we have never heard that before. <laughs> this is powerful. Now we understand. Let's act on it. Another one came to me, one of the board, powerful, influential people. Pastor, I got an idea. And he told me what I had been telling them for six months. I got an idea, let's do that. I said, that's a great idea, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares whose idea it is, as long as they do it. We are not looking for credits. We are looking for results. You follow me? Yeah. Anyway, it's the Holy Spirit credit. It's not mine or yours. And so it takes commitment. You don't just pray for a church or for a person one time and you expect changes. That's when you don't care. When you care, you commit. Hello? That's easy to say. It takes a lot of involvement, a lot of commitment. So prayer, we didn't pray. My wife and I, we didn't pray one time. We made the covenant with God. We are going to pray for this church one hour every day for a month. If nothing changes, we are going to increase one hour for the second month. If nothing going to change, we are going to increase one hour the third month, so three, three hours a day. If nothing going to change, Fourth month, we are going to pray four hours a day. And we will keep adding one hour until God would answer it. Mm -hmm. You heard me? What do you say, Prav, when you get to the third month and you pray three hours for the church? What do you say in three hours? Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> you don't pray generic. Lord, be with my church. That's when you don't care. We took the names, the, the church books, and we prayed over every single family, every mother, every father, every child. We prayed over every elder, every deacon. There were over 74 deacons, imagine. Every deacon, every Sabbath school teacher, every, uh, you follow me? Yeah. Every department. When you do that name by name, pfft, it's going to take time. <laughs> I mean, you don't manage to pray more than 30 names in, in one hour and a half or two hours. But something happens to you when you do that. After a month, guess what? I knew every family by name. I knew every kid. And when you invest so much in them, you really start caring for them. And not only that we prayed for them, but after a month, we started to pray with them. Not 100 people a day. I would pray with five a day, five families. But you know what happens when you call them and you pray by name for their children? Many of them told me, Pastor, none of the pastors before remember the names of my kids. You know the names? Yes, I've been praying for you every day for a month. <laughs> you really? You mean that? 100%. By name praying for you, your wife, your kids. Now I want to pray with you because I don't know what to pray for you. When you do it that first time, oh, they like it. You do that second time, you do that third time, you know what they get? This pastor is different. This pastor is a man of God. We can trust him. This pastor loves us. This pastor cares for us. You know the trust that he instills in the people and the environment that brings, let's work together. This is different than what we are used to. You follow me? When they see that you not once, but consistently, you don't give up after a month, second month, third month, fourth month, you consistently keep praying for them by name, they really start to love you, to respect you, to care for you. This pastor care for our kids, for our, my, my wife, for my husband. For, it brings an environment of unity. No longer saying, we are going to move you. <coughs> In fact, 
They called the conference, uite, au telinie, and the conference called me and said, they told us that if we move you, they will stop paying tight. <laughs> <laughs> and I told them, stop doing that, tight doesn't belong to you. You don't pay tight because it's God, you don't pay it, you return it, otherwise you are thieves. Stop doing that, tight belongs to God. Don't connect it with, if you vote my way, if you keep this, you know, come on. Pastor, we just want you to scare them so they don't touch you. They don't touch me anyway. Leave them alone. <laughs> Let God be God. Amen. You follow me? Anyway, so praying for them by name, it changes you. You start to know them. You start to care for them. Praying with them, it changes them. They start to know you. They start to trust you. And then they start to be open when you propose something different, they don't argue back because they love you by now. They would argue with a stranger, but when you are family, they know how to tolerate. You follow me? You pray for them, you pray with them. And then by preaching constantly on prayer, I didn't expect an answer. But after six, seven months of preaching, I started to ask them to pray, and then I started to teach them how to pray. And then in about a year, the whole church was praying. And we made rules. Because you need to follow up. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. You tell them to do it, you don't follow up, they don't do it. They have good intentions, they just forget. So I started to follow up. This is the rule. Nobody enters our door without being prayed for. So if somebody enters and I don't see you praying with that visitor, I'm going to get with you. And I was watching them. And I would say to the deacon or to the, hey, somebody came, nobody prayed for. I want you to announce in the church. After they leave, we had this problem. Somebody prayed. You do that two, three times, people get it. Visitors told me, we have never, ever, ever been in a church that prays so much. This is the most praying church we have seen in our lifetime. You know what happened when people, and then I told them, second rule, on the hallway, you are not allowed to talk to anybody before you pray for them. You cannot exchange or how are you doing or happy Sabbath before you pray for them. So you cannot, when you get there, you cannot talk before you pray. I said, you agree or you want me to look for a different district? No, we agree. <laughs> okay. I said, is it bad to pray for another? No, it's just hard. Is it expensive? No. Then why is hard? Well, we have never done it. Then do it. You don't have to pray a long prayer. You know what he did? When people pray for one another, they instantly tolerate one another. They stop fighting one another. People, you would see them on the hallway, putting their hand and let me pray for you. And when that happened, the church started to come together like never before. It became a praying church. It changed the environment. We had board meetings. They used to have board meetings started at 7 and finishing at 11. Everybody hated board meetings. Nobody would come to board meetings. I'm exaggerating to make a point. Long board meetings, long agenda, hating it. I told them, how much do you pray in board meetings? Well, we have a prayer in the beginning. Let's monitor, pray. Uh, pray. One minute. Okay. We change from next time we pray 40 minutes and have board meeting 20 minutes. We have an agenda, Pastor. We have to go through. You have always had an agenda. You have never accomplished anything. <laughs> Let's pray 40 minutes. What do we pray? Oh, uh, you'll see. Next board meeting, we started to pray. First two, three prayers, they were like, ah, boring. But I asked them, hey, open your heart. Mean it. And the more they pray, the more they open their heart. They became fervent in prayer. After 40 minutes of prayer, the environment was totally changed. We could sense God's presence. Instead of fighting and arguing, they were flexible, kind, humble. And I told them, we approach Choose four things, the most important four things in the agenda. Well, all is important. No. Choose four things. They chose, this is what we do. If we have time, we do another one. Sharp, 8 o'clock, we leave. If we didn't finish, I don't care. Oh, well, Pastor, we stop arguing. We finished board meeting. We made a rule after that one hour and a half. At one hour and a half, sharp, we dropped and we go home. And they told me, we love it. Then everybody started to come. Board meetings where you spend more time in prayer than planning or talking. Amen. You follow me? Amen. Totally different way of doing things. Think about it. 
you pray with them, you pray for them, you pray with them, you have them pray for one another, praying for visitors also, you preach on prayer, you give seminars on prayer, you have prayer in the boards, you have prayer in every activity, every church activity, doesn't matter if it's choir or youth, doesn't matter if it's Sabbath school, a lot of prayer. That church was immersed in prayer in everything they did. Instantly, we could sense a very spiritual environment. We could sense God's pre presence in the church. And they told me, we have never sensed so powerful presence before. The church could feel the change, could see the change. Prayer. Prayer didn't, was, was not only one year in the beginning. It was one year that they got to pray, but then continued through the process. Step two plus prayer. Step three plus prayer. You follow me? Prayer remained as the foundation of everything else. You follow me? Now let me explain something here about prayer. Very important. I preached on prayer and I asked them to pray. Guess what? Did they do it? No. Because if, when you make an appeal from the pulpit, please pray. Uh-huh. Okay. So instead of asking them from the pulpit to pray, I noticed what people are the most de dedicated to prayer. And I went to them eye to eye. And I said, uh, Jimmy or Mary, would you commit to start a prayer group in your house? When you ask them one to one, it happens. Because not everybody, according to Illinois, not everybody can come in the middle of the week, Wednesday night, to the prayer meeting. Because people have jobs, people live far away. And they may want to, but they may not be able to. And in the first century church, they prayed in homes. And so I said, this is what we do. Elena says, it, be, it has been shown to me by the one who cannot err, that the formation of small groups, you remember, is the key for the church. We had small groups. I talked to a lady retired. We want to start a prayer group with the retired people. Yes, when? Well, it has to be Wednesday night. That's the way we have had. No, it has to be whenever you want it. When can the retired people come? Well, we like mornings. We don't like late evenings. Okay. Well, Pastor, we can do Monday morning, 8 a.m. at my house. Praise the Lord. Monday morning, all the retired people go there. I talked to a student. You want to get the students? Yeah. When can you do it? Friday night. Uh, during the week, we are busy. Friday night in your house, you get all the students and pray. Then I talked to a doctor. You want to have a prayer meeting with doctors and nurses from our church? Yes. When can you do it? Well, I can do about Tuesday nights in my house. Tuesday night in your house. And then I took, and we started two, and then three, and then four, and then eight prayer groups. Wow. Those people that started to pray in groups eventually loved their groups more than me. <laughs> that was a little frustrating. <laughs> as soon as somebody was sick or somebody died, instead of calling me as they used to do, they would call the group. That shows the unity and the support that developed within the group. People that get emotional support are people who never leave the church because they have somebody, a friend. They have family there. Amen. You follow me? People that don't have anybody in the church leave the church. Not because of the doctrines. The survey says that 92% of the people who leave the church have nothing to do with doctrines. They just don't have a friend. And so, as soon as we had prayer groups, the church became united, healthy. We, did, we stopped having this, peop, this person angry that the church is criticizing me so bad. This person angry with the pastor. This person angry with the conference. Just stopped. Because they would encourage, support one another, pray for one another. You follow me? So we develop prayer groups. And then we announce in the church, we have seven groups. You can join that group if that day, that group, that day, that... You follow me? But then I started talking to others. Who wants to start another group? Because when you have the whole church in groups, that church is a beehive. 